Well, I just heard the record, and I mean, it's it's a lot of it's a fun record. It's it's a lot of fun. Was it as much fun to do? It sounds like you had a blast. Yeah, I mean, it was it wasn't done in one long stretch of time. It was very broken up because the people that I work with, um, Pharrell, Justin Timberlake, and Timberland are all very busy. They work with lots of different artists. They're on tour. They're in movies, et cetera, et cetera. So they were very um, um, hard to schedule. So I, you, I ended up doing the album in sort of two week stints and another wait a couple weeks and another two weeks stint, then wait another couple weeks, another two weeks stint. And then the, it, it, sort, it took much longer than I usually take to make a record just because there was so much space in between. With all the things that you're doing these days, I would mm -hmm. think you'd be hard to schedule as well. Well, I suppose my scheduling factored into it, but of course, my perspective is that they were difficult and I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. No, it w I think it, w it was hard for all of us to make our schedules coordinate, and, and that, that was the biggest challenge. When we actually got in the studio and started making music, it was actually quite simple. You have so much going on now with the films and, so, and the album and various other things. Mm. Is music, uh, does it, music still the, the foundation, the, the central part of, of your creative existence? Hmm. Is it the central part of my creative, creative existence? I mean, the, the thing about me is, is, in terms of creativity, the first place that I started expressing myself as an artist was through dance. And that's completely and utterly connected to music. So for me, becoming a songwriter and a singer and a performer was a perfect segue from dancing. And I think that even when I get involved in film projects, I always think of them in a very musical way. I think about what, what music's going to be scoring the scene. Music inspires me to write a scene. Um, so uh, I, I feel like music is still very much an integral part of every aspect of my creativity. Yeah. So you couldn't imagine just going a long time without making music? No, no, no. I, I know. I'm, I'm always going to want to write music and. I just, I just feel like music, music speaks to people in a way, and that that no other, um, no other or art form can. And it is, in my opinion, um, the most accessible art form. So, yeah, you could say it's my first love. Yes. <laughs> each time out, each time you make an album, it, it seems to have a, a, a new facet, a new uh, uh, territory that you're you're going into. With, with this one, did you have a very clear idea? Was there a clear idea at the beginning, before you started, as to what you wanted this to be? When I made the decision to work with Pharrell and Justin and Timberland, it was really just a matter of I loved their records. And after I made Confessions on a Dance Floor, I was scratching my head thinking, well, what do I want to do next? What kind of music do I want to do next? And so I asked myself, well, whose music do I love right now? Who am I listening to? What records am I buying? What makes me excited? What am I excited about right now, musically? And it was those three. So I thought, well, why don't I work with them? Yeah. And, and how, did. Did that, how did that come about? What was the, the process? Well, I looked their phone numbers up in the phone book. <laughs> no. Um, well, you know, that's where managers come in. They call other people's managers. And, and uh, actually, um, Justin and, and Timberland approached me. Um, and I think Pharrell did as well. But I think they just were, at first, they were just saying, like, we would love to just do one song with you kind of thing. And I thought, well, why just do one song? Well, let's do the whole record together. So, yeah. What was the first thing you did together? The first song I wrote with Pharrell was Candy, Sh uh, well, can, we can't decide whether it's called Candy Store or Candy Shop. I think it's called Candy Shop now, yes. What's the difference, right? Um, that's the first song that we wrote together. And the first song that I wrote with Justin and, and Timberland was Miles Away. Was it song. clear from the start that this was going that, the way you wanted? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's not my normal way of, of working. Um, because usually I work with, I don't usually work with other artists who are also performers. Like Pharrell, he makes his own records, he goes on tour, 
He's a singer himself. So is Justin and Timberland. They all, you know, they were all on tour when I was working with them. So it was a little bit of a different energy working with other performers. I'm, I'm used to being the diva in the room, and the person I'm with is much more of a support system for me. So I had to adjust to, you know, sharing diva space. Yeah. Um, which was fun, and you know, sometimes there was fireworks, but it, you know, it made it 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 made for something interesting because everybody was very opinionated, and um, once you adapt to that environment, then everything goes good. Going yeah. you to tell us who was the biggest diva? Who was the biggest diva? Um, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think we. I think we all. You know, depending on the week, we all won that sweepstake. Yeah. And uh, as it came together, you did you have a did it? Then have a sort of sense of of you know you knew at some point where it was going, what it was going to sound like, and. I just wanted to write songs that people couldn't get out of their heads, so, yeah, and hopefully I accomplished that. Right. Yeah. Uh, is is there a song that you think is the the sort of uh, central one around which the album revolves? Um, well, to a certain extent, I think the first single, Four Minutes to Save the World," is you know kind of the axis with which the rest of the album rotates off of because there's a sense of urgency to it. And there's a sense of seriousness about it, but at the same time, there's a sense of fun and levity. So I think, I think you get that through the whole record. Yeah. Let's talk about that song. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the sense of urgency. Do you think that's, are we in a state of the world where urgency is sort of? Yes, I think, you know, if, you, if you're paying attention to what's going on in the world and, you know, what's going on in the Middle East, what's going on with the elections, what's going on with the environment, what's going on with, there's just so much chaos and turmoil everywhere. And all signs point to everybody better wake up and start paying attention and to the world around them and what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be a part of the problem or a part of the solution? Um, but I also think people still need to be cheered on and be, you know, we need to have fun. We can't be paralyzed with all this negative information. You need to be given a, a sense of hope as well. So I think that four minutes to save the world sort of, you know, came from that idea, you know. Could you save the world with a song, you know? Do you, could you make people wake up and, you know, so it's kind of like the answer is yes and no. Yeah. Are, are, there, are there songs of the past that you've, you feel accomplished about, things that inspired you in that way? Other songs yeah. that have inspired me, what, to sort of take responsibility? Or, or the, I mean, the, uh, do you think there have been songs in, in the history of pop music that have, that, that have accomplished? I think, yeah, I think um, John Lennon's song, Imagine, is a perfect example of a song that's, first of all, it's just a great record, it's a great song, um, but the lyrics are genius and timeless, and, you know, they work just as well when he wrote it as they do now. Yeah. Let's go ahead and talk about the other songs. We can just go okay. more or less in order. Let's start, start with, with uh, Candy Star. You chose it to be the first on the album, so it's got a, uh, it, it's kind of setting the tone in that way. I think Candy Shop's one of my favorite records, and it sort of, uh, it personifies the mood that I was in when I was making the record, which is uh, kind of cheeky, um, wanting to have fun, um, liking the idea of having a play on words, wanting to dance, um, lots of innuendo. I don't know. Yeah, I just, I just, uh, I, I put it first because it's, it's, it, it also is a kind of an illustration of the, you know, the variety of songs that are on the record because when you go into a candy shop, you can get so many different things and hopefully that you can get that when you listen to the record. There's more serious songs, there's more fun songs, there's more up-tempo songs, there's more thoughtful songs. So, yeah. And obviously the title of the album is a play on that as well. Hard Candy, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it's just something you, can, candy is something you? Candy is something I'm very fond of, yes. Let's go back to, uh, to four minutes. I, uh, there's, there's some, 
some things in that track that are just incredible, that beat and the uh, mm. the horns track yeah. on it and all that. Was was that did that come from da, 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 da. Yeah. Was was that all brought in by was it Timberland? Uh, yeah, those are Timberland's horns, definitely. <laughs> Sounds like a marching band. Yeah. When when you did you have the lyrics when you heard the music or did they No, no, we wrote we wrote the lyrics, uh, Justin and I, after um, Timberland played us the beat. And we sort of did it in stages. He gave us a bit of the music, we started writing the lyrics. We came up with a melody, then he started writing more more music, and that's really how all the songs were written. Piecemeal. Now that goes right into another, I mean, fantastic track. Just, I mean, there's so much going on, so many layers on mm. Give It To Me. Yeah. Um, and there, and I mean, I was trying to write down some lines from it. There's just almost too much to. Yeah, Give It To Me is like the ultimate anthem kind of song. I, I think that would be a really great song to do live. Yeah, it's sort of, you just can just see everybody, the whole room, jumping. And it's the ultimate, like, sort of, you know, just do it. You know what I mean? Give me all you got. Don't try to stop me. It, it's, it's a, I think it's a great song to work out to. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, what was one line, you're only here to win? Exactly. Is that, yeah. is that yes. philosophy? Absolutely. It's, yeah, but it's so upbeat and joyous too. It's yeah. Well, that's how I felt that day in the studio with, with Pharrell and, and um, I think by the time we got to that stage of the record we'd already written several songs together. We just decided we needed to make some crazy up-tempo dance song and that was, Give It To Me was the result. Yeah. Uh, Heartbeats of Pharrell. Track, yeah. Okay. Um, that's one of those that sounds like it's a, it, it could almost work in any setting. It's a great pop melody and the structure is a pop song. Is, mm -hmm. did it, how, did this, how did it come together in this form? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I didn't overthink how, how we were going to come up with songs. We just wanted to write um, catchy melodies. And uh, I think Pharrell's quite genius at, at coming up with with music that has like a lot of crossover appeal. You know, it could be kind of R&B, it's sort of pop, it's, you could hear it on the radio, you could hear it in a club. Um, so, we just, like I said, we just wanted to write songs that you couldn't get out of your head. Yeah. It sounds like one of those songs that somebody, could, I mean, somewhere down the line, I, I'll bet there'd be some great covers or people. You think? I think Heartbeat? it could. I think it could. Huh, okay. All right, if you don't want. Maybe. Uh, let's see, the next song is uh, Miles Away. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, that has this, this theme, long distance. Love affair? Love, love affair. Is this, yes. You know, uh, I mean, the idea of, of, I mean, with your lifestyle, I would think you're apart from people you love a lot. Yeah. Yeah, but I think also people in my business. We can all, when, actually when we were writing the song, everybody, all the guys in the studio were like, yeah, man, I could totally relate to this song. It's just, you know, if you work and, and if traveling is, is a big part of your work and you're already always separated from the person that you love, you end up having a lot of long distance relationships and it's um, a challenge. So I think lots of people can relate to that song. Yeah. She's Not Me is the next song. Is that the next song? I, yeah, yeah. I so. Yeah, yeah. Now that's a... That's a fun one. I mean, first of all, that bass line. Mm -hmm. Very old school. Kind of, uh, we, we were listening to a lot of um, Debbie Harry records when we made that. So, so I think, yeah, She's Not Me is kind of like somewhere Debbie Harry meets Gloria Gaynor, I Will Survive, kind of. Yeah. Where did the story in the song come from? Um, well, Pharrell came in with, with, with the hook. Um, She's not me. She doesn't have my name, believe it or not. And so we just concocted a story about the ultimate jilted lover. Yeah. I also love the bridge in that, but it just sort of comes out. So of... very psychedelic, right? Yeah. Me too. I love that song. Yeah. No, it's, it it's... goes a lot of different places. And you know Wendy from um, The Revolution plays uh, guitar on it. So that's why we say Wendy. You're, you might be wondering why we say that that name in the middle of the song. She plays, gosh, she's such a good, good guitar player. Um, so she play, plays guitar on that track. 
And lucky for us, she was recording her album down the hall when we were making it. And lucky for us, Kanye was recording his album across the hall while we were making our record. So we just sort of kept pulling people in. Will you be on the record? So it was great. People don't tend to say no. Oh, actually, they do. <laughs> I love Wendy. Though. Everyone says yes for a price, though. <laughs> uh, let's see. The next track is uh, incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an, this is another one that sounds like it could could almost be any kind of setting. That it, it's one of those solid. I mean, it's a really solid song. Yeah, but it kind of it's incredible. Kind of it starts off as one song and turns into another song. So. That song, like She's Not Me, kind of takes you on a musical journey. Starts off in one place and ends up somewhere else, which is obviously where my head is at right now. I'm all over the place musically. Yeah. It also I mean, has a couple different levels of, of sort of the emotional thing. I mean, this is really... Mm -hmm. There's a lot of angst in it and a lot of desire, the idea of desire and wanting something that used to be, wanting to, you know, get back to something, you know, wanting to recreate um, some feeling of happiness and fulfillment, but then there's also just abandonment and having a good time kind of thing. I think most of my songs are really pretty much paradoxes or a sort of juxtapositions of ideas and emotions. Yeah. I, I'm sure people read into your songs trying to get clues. Of course they do. And I, but everyone does. I mean, and that's really what art's all about. You, one person looks at a painting and they think it's about one thing, and somebody else thinks it's about something else. That you know, one person watches a movie and gets one thing out of it, another person gets something else, and that goes for music too. And I think that's what's so great because, you know, in a way, you don't want to tell people exactly what you were thinking or what you think the music is about or the story is about because people should be able to um, tune into their personal frequency and let it resonate the way that it does for them. Yeah. Do you want people to keep guessing as to whether it's an autobiographical song? or I mean, not this song in particular, but any song? I don't. Well, they can guess or they cannot. I'd rather they just personalize it and relate to it in a, in, a, in a way that they can. And I think most of the songs you can, because everybody experiences loss. Everybody wants something they can't have. Everybody... Um, takes things for granted. Everybody just wants to have fun. You know what I mean? So I think you, you, they're pretty universal, the themes. Yeah. Oh, Beat Goes On. That's, I, love, I love that, too. There's that kind of urban pop soul yep. thing happening there. Mm -hmm. um, now, this one has what it musically has a motif in it that, it that pops up with sort of a bell. I think it's glockenspiel in this one, but the bells kind of sound. Yeah, there's that. There's a sort of, there's a bit of an homage to Marvin Gaye. Um, there's, you know, there's Kanye's rap. There's, there's a lot of, I don't know, I think we were, we were, um, channeling lots of different artists from the past in that song. Yeah. Talk about Kanye's rap. How, you know, did that, was that, did that come very freely from him? Yeah, it took a while. I, 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 I couldn't understand. I mean, one thing that, surprised me about all of these guys, Pharrell, Justin, Kanye, is that you know, I'm a very anal person and I write everything down and I'm very structured and methodical and ordered and none of them write anything down. None of them know what they're going to do when they go into the studio. So what happens is because they don't write anything down, you have to keep doing take after take after take after take until they can remember it from beginning to end, the whole idea. So it does take a long time, but then, you know, there's a lot of elements of surprise so you just record a lot of tracks and choose the best of the best. So, yeah, that took about, I have to say, I don't know, six to eight hours. Yeah. So you had, did you have to adapt the way you work at all? I mean, in terms of writing and things for that as well? I did because I, as I said, I write in a very organized, methodical way, and they don't. So I had to kind of get into their head and create on their wavelength and let go of a little bit of sort of, must have order, must be in control. <laughs> um, and it, it was fun coaching uh, Kanye and his rap because, you know, I don't rap. I don't really work on rap records. And so um, it was, it was, Pharrell was laughing at me the whole time because I kept pressing, like, no, repeat that. Like, repeat what? And then I tried to do what he was doing. And anyway, it was fun. It was a learning experience.
I would say, as an artist, is it good to sometimes get into other people's space? Absolutely. It's the best thing to get outside your comfort zone and do things you don't normally do. Yeah, that's what keeps you alive as, a, as an artist. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, it seems that, that from album to album there's something... New and different? New and different, but it, but it feels <laughs> like you're learning, each step away, you're learning something new about yourself. And so I'd, like, you know, I'd be yeah. curious what, what it was you learned with this one. Well, I think every time you put yourself in an uh, un unusual environment or an environment you're not used to, you're going to learn something about yourself. You're going to learn how you must cope, learn to make compromises, be comfortable with, you know, the unknown. Like, you know, there were days where I just was like, oh, this is not exactly how I do things. This is not how I do things. But then you go, you know what? This is how they do things. So just let it go. Um, and some days I got more bothered than that. But, you know, I, I think it's important. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of talented artists out there, and I think that um, sometimes you get into the habit of just repeating what's familiar to you. Um, I think it's good to take risks and try new things. I really do. I mean, you, I suppose, earned the right to play it safe if you chose, but I guess that wouldn't be you. Well, how does one earn the right to play it safe? <laughs> I wouldn't, I'd never want to do that. It sounds so boring. Uh, so next we have uh, Dance Tonight, which is, uh, it feels like almost like a community anthem in some ways. Yeah, that's also a throwback to sort of like late 70s, early 80s, kind of that whole Philly soul kind of, or, you know, kind of the sound that uh, um, was happening in nightclubs when I first got to New York in the early 80s as well. Yeah. It kind of examines the, the sort of what it, what it means to be in the spotlight, what it means to be on the dance floor, or... Well, we weren't really into examining. It was just really about, you know, a guy meets a girl in a nightclub and they both like each other. <laughs> Don't read too much into it. <laughs> I promise you, it's not that deep. <laughs> it's good to know, because, as you said, everybody tends to. Mm -hmm. um, the next one's a real change of Spanish lessons. Mm -hmm. um, do, you have, do you have fun doing that one? I did. I, I that Spanish lesson came from Pharrell playing me all these all these songs from from Baltimore, Maryland. There's this sound coming out of Baltimore. He kept calling it the Be More Beat, and I was like, "What's that?" So he kept playing me all these records and this dance that everybody did to it called the Percolator. So we were watching all these clips on YouTube, people dancing. So I said, "Okay, let's try that," and I brought in my guitar player Monty to play. Um, this like Spanish riff and I we just that's just one of those made it up on the spot kind of scenarios and and after I heard it after we did it and we finished it I thought no, this is too weird and I actually didn't like it for a while and then I became fond of it again so it is it's a real change up it's nice. yeah different yeah. Mm. how's your Spanish um bueno <laughs> gracias <laughs> about my Spanish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can speak Spanish very well. Uh, <laughs> the Devil is a really interesting song. The Devil Wouldn't Recognize You? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, with, with the sort of emotional layers. Yeah. That was the, the last two songs are more, more layered, and I would say they're deeper than most of the other songs. Yeah. Is that intentional to put them, those at the end of the record? Yeah, because they're more thought-provoking, and they're slower in tempo, and I wanted it, you know, you sort of go on a ride on the record and go up and up and up and up and up, and then that's like the chill-out section. Yeah. Yeah, but there's an intensity to them in, in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, was it, wh how, were they, where were these done in the course of making the record? Were these done at the en toward the end of the making, or? Actually, The Devil Wouldn't Recognize You and Voices were both written in my first like chunk of, of writing time with, with Justin. So um, we basically sat down together and every, every day and said, okay, what, you know, we always had to think of a concept. What do we want to write a song about? Um, and The Devil Wouldn't Recognize You is essentially a song about a person that, you know, and everybody has one in their life, the person that gets away with everything. 
you know, you're so clever, even the devil wouldn't recognize you. So that, so, and we start riffing off of each other and coming up with ideas and phrases. So that happened. And then the next day, voices, that was, that was really um, another, you know, kind of like, we were talking about people that we knew who, who, um, once again, uh, could trick you into thinking one thing about them, but actually they were something else. It's, you know, it's um, people that play mind games and, you know, go on ego trips and they don't realize that actually, you know, that's the line, are you walking the dog or is the dog walking you? It's like, who's in control here? You know what I mean? And it ends with this sort of big dramatic flourish. I mean, some albums just sort of fade, fade out. This one has a real end to it. Yeah. It's kind of operatic, the ending. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the last two songs are, are good because they really make you think. And there's something very orchestral and lush about them. And, and so, you know, we kind of, you start out light with Candy Shop and you end up in a very thoughtful way with voices. And I think that's kind of a good journey to go on. Now, this album also represents, a, it comes at a time of, of some change for you it's a, is it, uh, in terms of, of business relationships and, oh. and things you're moving yes. on. Yes. <laughs> it's my last record for Warner Brothers Records, whom I've been very loyal to for the last 25 years. Yeah. Do you consider it in some ways sort of a, a, a legacy or a summing up record in that regard? No, I don't think so. I just thought, you know, let my let my last record with Warner Brothers be as great as my first record. Yeah. Let's go out in a bang. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll be going out uh, touring. With yeah, it, so. with a bang. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so, yes. Have you given any thoughts to, to uh, what the tour is going to, what the shape it's going to have this time? Um, well, uh, I've thought about it, but um, I'm, just, I'm just at the coming up with ideas stage and sort of hashing them out with people, not really having anything concrete. Yeah. It takes me a while to come up with like what my concept is going to be. You, you still love doing these shows, right? I love hate them. I, I love putting them together and I love the first two weeks and the last two weeks of the tour. Everything in between is hard work. <laughs> would, would you ever want to do um, the, the, the sort of, you know, Vegas set up like, like Cher and Elton? No, I'm not very fond of Vegas. So, no, I don't think so. I'd like to do a setup and stay in one city for a long time, but not Vegas. Yeah. So the idea of... I'll take Rome, for instance, or Paris, or, yeah, London, New York. Yeah. You think it's a possibility someday? As soon as they build a casino in one of those places, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>